All right, good evening again. Open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. Jeremiah, or Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and then Daniel. You can go to the middle, start heading to the right. And you'll run into the shorter book of Daniel after the very long book of Ezekiel. So there's a little bit of a way to find it. All right, the book of Daniel. Here, we have now in front of us with our new study, we have one of the most important and impressive books uh, in the Bible as a whole, but certainly one of the most important and impressive books of prophecy uh, that we have in the scriptures. This book's uh, prophetic importance is made all the more relevant for us because of the times in which we live. Other generations have uh, certainly taken to studying this book before us and have surely benefited from doing so. But as we observe the developments in our world today, as we watch the news, as we see how things on one hand seem to be unraveling while things on the other hand in, in, uh, seem to be coming together uh, or culminating in various ways, some good, some not so good, uh, geopolitically, culturally, things like that. And when we also consider how many prophetic parallels can be drawn between the prophecies of Daniel from the Lord to the apocalyptic visions of John from the Lord in the book of Revelation. And when we have all that in mind, all of it makes, uh, I think, a very solid case for us to be taking the time and the effort right now, in these days, to come to this extraordinary book together, to study it, to learn from it, and to grow. To grow in readiness, to grow in expectation, to grow in watchfulness and usefulness for the Lord in these last days. Another aspect of this book that is very important for us to learn from is the actual person of Daniel himself, the character of the actual man. Certainly the prophetic visions that he records and interprets for us are astonishing and important and are probably what make the book as popular as it is. But we cannot miss and dare not really miss the extraordinary life of the man, Daniel. His was a life extremely well-lived in faithfulness and in diligence and in endurance in service for the Lord God. Under very uh, challenging and difficult circumstances, far from home and in a pagan kingdom, under pressure and persecution to conform the practice of his faith or face dire consequences. Under also, we would have to say, under also the heavy hand of God himself, that Daniel would be set apart and courageous in a position of leadership and of influence while many opposed him and while many opposed his God. And also in situations where he was sometimes the only one left or the only one in a particular given situation, the only one faithful to God, almost like a one-man remnant, it would seem for him at times. And so the faith and the perseverance and the godly courage of Daniel as a person is something that we can and that we should learn from in this study, just as much as we intend to benefit from the incredible prophetic portions that we're going to come to as well in the weeks ahead. All of which should equip us and prepare us to live faithfully and fruitfully for our Lord in our time, especially as our time, I think, is inarguably among the last of days. And so I'm going to ask you to pray with me again as we then begin to now study this book. God, our Father, and we come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for your word We thank you for this particular portion of your word, this book of Daniel. This study that we have looked forward to for some time now, this study that is 
that is rich and that is deep and that is so amazingly applicable to the times in which we live and the times that we can easily see are around the bend. We pray, God, that you would do these two great things for us in our study of this book, that through the prophetic power and accuracy of this book, Lord, you would ready us for times to come. And through the character and the faithfulness of the man, Daniel, you would also teach us and instruct us and encourage us, Lord, to be in that same way, daring and courageous and bold for the Lord our God, regardless of any cost to our life here on this earth. We desire to learn these things. And we pray, Lord, tonight as we begin this study in this first portion of the opening chapter, that we would get a good handle on the history, a good handle on the events going on at the time, and a good handle, Lord, on what it is that Daniel and his friends faced going into this time period. We ask, Lord, that you would speak and strengthen us in your ways through our study in this book tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. The book of Daniel is 12 chapters long. With the first half, the first six chapters, are in simple historical narrative style in the third person. And it's an easy read to go through those first six chapters. As you can see, being third person historical narrative, they simply and very basically and straightforwardly record simple events in history, dealing with real people in real places and time. Namely, Daniel and his friends among the people, also kings, at various times, the king of Babylon, also the kings of Persia, under whom Daniel served for many decades in both of those kingdoms. Daniel's time of service overlapped both the time of Babylonian dominance and Persian Median dominance as well. The second half of this book is where we find the records of what Daniel himself recorded regarding the prophetic visions shown to him by the Lord, mostly not completely, but mostly dealing with the end of days. When we get to those later prophetic chapters, we'll see that they're clearly what Daniel himself personally recorded as he speaks in the first person on many occasions in those chapters. However, because of those significant differences between the two halves of the book, it can appear that Daniel might not have been the author Himself, And it can, appear, it can appear that instead it was written about him and about his times while also certainly including the events and especially the visions that Daniel himself had recorded uh, himself earlier. It's in fact believed by some that the book of Daniel was not written out in the form that we have it here necessarily until perhaps as late a time as the era of the Maccabees in Israel during the 2nd century BC, which would be some 400 years or so after the main times of Daniel's adult life. Under the intense persecution that the Jews were suffering at that time in the 2nd century BC, in the face of growing corruption uh, of their people by Greek culture and Paganism, and certainly because of the particularly brutal treatment of the Jews by the Greeks under Antiochus Epiphanes, during that time we can certainly understand that the book of Daniel would have been a great encouragement to them during those times because Daniel represents a man who went through those similar kinds of things. However, a big reason for that late dating of the authorship of this book had to do with many scholars trouble explaining the accuracy of the prophecies. The accuracy of the prophecies is a tremendous challenge, especially if you do not know the God who authored them. And so when you read things like that, for the carnal mind, for the one who doesn't know God, doesn't believe in this God, this true and living, eternal, all-knowing God, if you don't believe in that God, then you have accurate prophecies recorded and, you, and your only conclusion can be, since you don't believe in that God, your only conclusion can be that they were recorded after the events that they describe. That's the only explanation. Absent of God, 
That's the only explanation for the accuracy of the record. Now, that is the biggest reason why you have some of these people or these scholars, in fact, who have gone through that late dating, rather than do what ought to be done and give the real author credit, uh, the credit that he deserves. The real author, as we have said, is God Almighty, that God who spoke to Daniel about the future. That being said, other scholars have no problem with Daniel himself actually being the author, even though there are those sections that go from third person to first person, and it can seem awkward perhaps to some. These scholars point out that in ancient writings, it actually was not uncommon for writers to go from third person to first person in the things that they recorded and described. And so even though the changes in style are there, and even though the accuracy of the prophecies challenge the mind of the reader, there is no great reason to insist that Daniel did not write this book. And so as far as we're concerned, and certainly as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to leave it at that. Especially since neither I nor you have any problem whatsoever with a God who knows the end from the beginning and speaks therefore then very accurately to those who have ears to hear, particularly in this case to the prophets about times to come. So we sit here this evening and I think I can speak for myself at the very least and say I have no problem with that. And I don't think that many of you here tonight, if any, have any problem with that either. And so therefore, with that being said, we can go ahead and should go ahead now and get into the text itself in Daniel chapter 1. And we're going to be able now to further identify some times and some places. We're going to do a lot of historical stage setting here this evening before we get further on into the text. And so we're going to look at just a few verses here at the start. And as I said, a lot of stage setting, a lot of historical uh, looking into the time period, what's going on, and how it is that Daniel even finds himself all the way over there in Babylon. So let's begin in the text now, studying Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. And there it says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his, Nebuchadnezzar's, hand, with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, that's over to Babylon, and he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. So there we have our historical point on the timeline that we're going to begin working with tonight. This timeline is when Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon besieged Jerusalem in Judah when it was ruled by Jehoiakim. That's our first point on the line. That was, that siege, that time period there, that assault by the Babylonians against Judah and Jerusalem in particular, that was the beginning of the judgment of God on Judah and on Jerusalem that the Lord had actually been long warning his people was coming. Many decades before that, the northern kingdom of Israel had been conquered and taken away captive by the Assyrians, when Assyria was the regional superpower eventually replaced by the Babylonians. Now that took place, the Assyrian conquest of the northern kingdom of Israel took place in 722 B.C., After that, the southern kingdom of Judah, where Jerusalem was, was on the clock. They were on the clock for judgment from God themselves because they refused to learn from Israel's apostasy and idolatry and the consequences of it. Even though God's word all the way back and from Moses, in the time of Moses, written in the law, Even though all the way back then God warned them strongly, sternly, and specifically what would take place to them if they walked away from him and turned themselves over to idolatry and therefore apostasy. So even though the warnings through Moses still sat for them there in the law to read and to consider and to take seriously, and even though as far as Judah is concerned in the time of young Daniel, even though they had witnessed firsthand the destruction of Israel to the north. One of the major prophets during that time of warning Judah was Jeremiah. 
So keep your place here with me, if you would, in Daniel chapter 1, and turn over to Jeremiah chapter 3. Jeremiah chapter 3. Going backward from Daniel, you have Ezekiel, you have Lamentations, and then you have Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 3. And here, let's see what the Lord said through Jeremiah the prophet to the leaders and the people of Judah in Jeremiah chapter 3, and we'll pick up together tonight for now in verse 6. It says, The Lord said also to me, Jeremiah, in the days of Josiah the king. Now let me just stop here real quick and give us another a real basic quick overview of the history of the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. You remember that Saul was the first king of of Israel united. Then came David, then came Solomon. After Solomon, there was the split in the kingdom, north and south. David's line through Solomon continued on the throne in Judah in the southern kingdom, whereas other kings then followed in several different families over different times and assassinations and a new person on the throne, all that kind of stuff happened uh, certainly in the northern kingdom of Israel. And as I just said, uh, Israel was eventually taken away captive by the Assyrians. Israel never had a good and godly king on their throne. The northern kingdom of Israel never had a godly king. The southern kingdom of Judah, after Saul, David, Solomon, and then Solomon's sons, and then the, the line of David continuing after that, They, for about the first half of that time frame where Judah was its own kingdom, for about the first half or so, mostly had godly kings, mostly had good kings who followed the Lord. And as the scriptures say, the phrasing that it uses there is that they did good or they did right in the sight of the Lord. They kept the Lord's laws. They they kept the, the, the worship in the temple. They didn't bother the priests, the sacrifices. All those things continued When you get to the back half here, as I just mentioned here from Jeremiah chapter 3, you get to Josiah, who's the last godly king of Judah. After him are all ungodly kings. And that is what leads very directly and quickly then to the Babylonian conquest of the southern kingdom of Judah and the destruction of Jerusalem, which obviously leads directly into the captivity in Babylon and why Daniel is even there at all. So here, before those things took place, okay, after Israel to the north had been destroyed by the Assyrians, as God had warned them that they would be if they did not repent, they did not repent, and so they got what what God said was coming. So between Israel's destruction and Judah's judgment, you have the prophet Jeremiah on the scene. And in Jeremiah 3, as I just began to read in verse 6, again, I'll come back to it now, it says, The Lord also said to me, Jeremiah, in the days of Josiah, the king. And he was even a good king, but nonetheless, here's what God says. Have you seen what backsliding Israel has done? She has gone up on every high mountain and under every green tree, and there played the harlot. And I said, after she had done all these things, return to me. This is God speaking. But she did not return, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. Then I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. So it came to pass through her casual harlotry that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. And yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah has not turned to me with her whole heart, but only in pretense, says the Lord, only in appearance. As the religious system continued on and people continued to do sacrifices, offerings, observe holidays and so on, holy days, but it was only in appearance. In their hearts, they were certainly idolatrous and apostatizing, departing from the Lord. So there you have just in that passage there, God through Jeremiah speaking to the people, pleading with Judah, saying, did you not take notice to what just happened to Israel and why? Not just what happened, but why? That they had brought the judgment of God on themselves for having done about everything he told them not to do. And he said, Judah, three times there in only a few verses, calls Judah treacherous. The treachery of Judah's betrayal of her God. 
especially as the point is being made there, especially in light of the fact of what had just happened to Israel. How can you observe that take place and know why and for some reason think the same thing won't happen to you for the exact same reasons if you're guilty of the exact same stuff? And so there you have there the treachery that God describes of Judah having observed that take place to their older sister Israel and yet it does nothing to their hearts. It does nothing to bring them in true repentance back to the Lord. But only in pretense, only in appearance did they continue their religiosity. But in their hearts they were not interested in anything having to do with actually following, obeying, loving, serving the Lord. And so there you have that from Jeremiah chapter 3. And that's not the only place or the only time where God through Jeremiah warned Judah. God continued to warn them primarily through Jeremiah, other prophets as well, but primarily through Jeremiah for many, many years. Turn over to Jeremiah chapter 25. I'll begin reading as you get there, Jeremiah 25, verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah. In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, which was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, which Jeremiah the prophet spoke to all the people of Judah and to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, From the thirteenth year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even to this day, This is the 23rd year in which the word of the Lord has come to me, Jeremiah, and I have spoken to you, rising early and speaking, but you have not listened. And the Lord has sent to you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, but you have not listened nor inclined your ear to hear. They said, the prophets said, repent now, everyone, of his evil way and of his evil doings, and dwell in the land that the Lord has given to you and your fathers forever and ever. Do not go after other gods to serve them and worship them, and do not provoke me to anger with the works of your hands, and I will not harm you. Yet you have not listened to me, says the Lord, that you might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, says the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. And I will bring them against this land, against its inhabitants, and against these nations all around, and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment, a hissing, and perpetual desolations. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the lamp. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these kings shall serve the king of Babylon Seventy years. While we're here, let's also turn over quickly to Jeremiah 46. Where the Lord now speaks to Jeremiah about the specifics of how that's going to begin to take place. That judgment that he's warned them is coming. Jeremiah 46 verses 1 and 2, the word of the Lord which came to Jeremiah the prophet against the nations, against Egypt. Concerning the army of Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, which was by the river Euphrates in Carchemish, and which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, defeated in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. We're not going to go any further into the specific prophecy there. I just wanted to give you that particular history, which we're going to talk about a little bit more. The reason that Babylon, the reason that Jews, in in earthly terms, let's say it that way, In earthly terms, the reason that Judah and Jerusalem got on Nebuchadnezzar's radar is because, as we'll see shortly, Judah had become a vassal or had had become submitted to Egypt during that time. Egypt was a, a fairly significant power, really not much compared to Babylon, but certainly more powerful than Judah. Judah had come under Egypt. Egypt had actually, by force, Uh, taken uh, the uh, king prior to Jehoiakim, had taken him, as we'll read shortly, gave him a new name and said, you're now under our control. Well, when Egypt marched and Babylon marched, and when the great armies of Egypt and Babylon came together in battle, Babylon wins. The Babylonian army defeats utterly, in fact, the Egyptian army. And so all those that were under Egyptian control, the Babylonians are now going to give them some attention. Well, who's on the way back home, if you know your map? 
Israel, Judah, Jerusalem, who Babylon knew had been under Egypt's control more or less, uh, for the most part given some autonomy to operate as its own kingdom, but had been, uh, uh, had been giving tribute to Egypt and so on. So they were kind of under the Egyptian umbrella at the time, and so that got Babylon's attention. And so on the way back, you see, and we'll see further evidence of it, that uh, Nebuchadnezzar gives some attention to Jerusalem. The great battle between the armies of Babylon and the armies of Egypt took place around 605 BC. And as I've said, that's what leads then to Nebuchadnezzar making what is his first siege against Jerusalem. It was the first, in fact, of three sieges by Babylon against Jerusalem over a 19-year span. The Bible does not record the first one specifically, but Babylonian history does. Over at the British Museum of History, they have the Babylonian tablets that were first discovered, or the discovery of them began, actually, the first parts of it in 1887. It was several decades before the full publishing of the interpretation of what was recorded on the tablets uh, back, I think, in the 1950s, if I remember right, somewhere in there before it was actually published and made, uh, made public. When it was, uh, people f- uh, saw that the ta- those Babylonian tablets included details of political and military information uh, that included up to the first 10 years of Nebuchadnezzar's reign as king, and therefore included this first siege of Jerusalem in 605. And so it's the Babylonian tablets themselves that actually give that the date that we rely on now. 605 BC, when the Babylonian army defeated the Egyptian army, and uh, it might have been 606, 605 for the battle itself, but 605 is the first siege of Jerusalem by Babylon. Other historical sources tell us that Nebuchadnezzar's first siege was cut short because he got word of his father's death back home and uh, left the siege of Jerusalem and very, very quickly covered hundreds of miles to go back home very fast to secure the throne. So with that said, we have the prophets, Jeremiah in particular, the things that God had been saying to Judah leading up to Daniel's time period. We have history outside the scriptures as well that confirm these kinds of events. Let's get back to the biblical record and let's put as much of the whole picture together of this time period as we can. So let's turn now further to the left, 1 Kings chapter 23. 1 Kings chapter 23. You're going to pass Psalms, you're going to pass Proverbs, you're going to pass Ezra and Nehemiah, you're going to pass Second and then First Chronicles. And then you're going to come to Second Kings. What did I say? Well, forget that. Second Kings, twenty-three. Second Kings twenty-three. You can go to First Kings twenty-three. It's good. Uh, but for our purposes tonight, uh, I'm going to find myself in Second Kings twenty-three. And we're going to begin actually right near the end of the chapter, verse 35. So Jehoiakim, again, this is the king over Judah during the first siege by Babylon. Jehoiakim gave the silver and gold to Pharaoh. Actually, let me just back up, actually. Pharaoh Necho had put, uh, as I said earlier, Eliakim, the son of Josiah, uh, he had put him in place of uh, Josiah there. And so, uh, as I as I mentioned earlier, Pharaoh has a kind of a tribute control over Judah. And so there again, verse 35, Jehoiakim gave the silver and gold to Pharaoh, but he taxed the land to give money according to the command of Pharaoh. He exacted the silver and gold from the people of the land, from everyone to his assessment to give to Pharaoh Necho. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zebudah, the daughter of Pedaiah of Rumah. And he, Jehoiakim, did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his fathers had done. Continuing on, it says, In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up, and Jehoiakim became his vassal for three years. That's after Babylon had defeated Egypt. He was a vassal of Egypt, now he's a vassal of Babylon. And then, though, after three years, it says, he turned and rebelled against him, against Nebuchadnezzar. And the Lord then sent against him, against Jehoiakim, raiding bands, of Chaldeans, bands of Syrians, bands of Moabites, and bands of the people of Ammon. 
He sent them against Judah to destroy it according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken by his, prof- by his servants, the prophets. So there you have those verses there. Go down with me now to verse 6. Continuing, it says, So Jehoiakim, this is uh, after Jehoiakim dies. So Jehoiakim rested with his fathers. Then Jehoiakim, his son, reigned in his place. The king of Egypt did not come out of his land anymore, for the king of Babylon had taken all that belonged to the king of Egypt from the book, brook of Egypt to the river Euphrates. That's a massive swath of land that now Babylon has under control that Egypt did, but Egypt is defeated, and now Judah uh, is under Babylon's control. So Jehoiakim, verse 8, was 18. Uh, 18 years old when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem three months. His mother's name was Nehushta, the daughter of El Nathan of Jerusalem. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father had done. And at that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem and the city was besieged. This is siege number two. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city as his servants were besieging it. Then Jehoiakim, king of Judah, his mother, his servants, his princes, and his officers went out to the king of Babylon, and the king of Babylon in the eighth year of his reign took him prisoner. So there we have that passage there. Let's actually catch the next few verses. And he, Nebuchadnezzar, carried out from there all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. And he cut in pieces all the articles of gold which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord, as the Lord had said. Also he carried into captivity all Jerusalem, all the captains and all the mighty men of valor, 10,000 captives and all the craftsmen and smiths. None remained except the poorest people of the land. And he carried Jehoiakim captive to Babylon, the king's mother, the king's wives, his officers, and the mighty of the land he carried into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon, all the valiant men, 7,000, and craftsmen and smiths, 1,000, all who were strong and fit for war. These the king of Babylon brought captive to Babylon. And then we'll do one more in Second Kings chapter 25 this time. It says, Now it came to pass in the ninth year, this is after now Jehoiakim's reign, in the ninth year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar's, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came against Jerusalem and encamped against it. Siege number three. And they built a siege wall against it all around. But the city was besieged until the eleventh year of King Zedekiah, who followed Jehoiakim. By the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine had become so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. Then the city wall was broken through, and all the men of war fled at night by way of the gate between two walls, which was by the king's garden, even though the Chaldeans were still encamped all around against the city. And the king went by way of the plain. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king, and they overtook him in the plains of Jericho. All his army was scattered from him. So they took the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah, and they pronounced judgment on him. Then they killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, put out the eyes of Zedekiah, bound him with bronze fetters, and took him to Babylon. And in the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, which was the nineteenth year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. He burned the house of the Lord and the king's house, all the houses of Jerusalem, that is, all the houses of the great, he burned with fire. And all the army of the, Ch- of the Chaldeans, who were with the captain of the guard, broke down the walls of Jerusalem all around. Then Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive the rest of the people who remained in the city, and the defectors who had deserted to the king of Babylon with the rest of the multitude. But the captain of the guard left some of the poor of the land as vine dressers and farmers, the bronze pillars that were in the house of the Lord, and the carts and the bronze sea that were in the house of the Lord. The Chaldeans broke in pieces and carried their bronze to Babylon. They also took away the pots, the shovels, the trimmers, the spoons, and all the bronze utensils with which the priests ministered. It sounds like the Grinch. He took away the, I forget how that list goes when you hear it read in the cartoon, but every single possible thing of value that could be taken, he took it. And that's not unlike what we are seeing here. With great detail, the fire pans, the basins, the things of solid gold and solid silver, all of that the captain of the guard took away. The two pillars, the one sea, the carts which Solomon had made for the house of the Lord, the bronze of all these articles was beyond measure, and it goes on with more detail from there. So you see over three sieges over this extended period of time, beginning in 605, you have the first siege where it takes place. It's shorter than Nebuchadnezzar probably planned. We already said why. But with that first siege, he took with him some people. Daniel is believed to have been one of those. 
with that second siege, which was 597 BC, that we already read from back in 1 Kings. With the second siege, he took away more. First siege, he took away stuff and like the best of the best, the cream of the crop of the people of Judah. The young and the talented that we'll read about here again uh, elsewhere shortly, but that's Daniel among that very cream of the crop, especially these young men who are the future of Judah. Well, now they're going to be the future of Babylon. These young men that are believed to be in their early to mid-teens. And that would have been Daniel and his friends taken away at that time. In the second siege, uh, the Nebuchadnezzar took away more of the possessions from the treasury of the Lord and more of the people. In the third siege, it's complete destruction. Utter destruction. That's 586 B.C. And so I said 19 earlier, it's 21 years. But at any rate, no, it's 19. 605 to 586. And you count backwards, it gets complicated. At any rate, you have that time frame there. And in the third siege, then, as we just read, complete, utter destruction. Judah completely conquered. Jerusalem as the city, the walls, the temple completely destroyed. Uh, the stuff g- written about in detail, which I didn't even include all the detail that followed, all of that stuff now taken away. And the poorest of the very poor left in the land to be vine dressers, to tend the farms, and to produce and to send back to Babylon, whatever could be sent back. But it's very, very little now, both of people and stuff, left in the desolate kingdom of Judah and the desolate city, which the holy city, now the desolate city, here, Jerusalem. So that's what you have there recorded for us in Second Kings. Second Chronicles 36, turn there, if you would, please. You have a similar history for us recorded there. First and second kings is the history of the era of the kings of both Israel and Judah. And if you read through there, uh, you see that it goes back and forth telling you about Israel for a time and then Judah uh, as it kind of parallels the king's eras back and forth. Chronicles is just about Judah. And so you have some more detail about Jerusalem in particular recorded there. And in second Chronicles 36, again, you have very similar things described there. And there you can see the different times that Nebuchadnezzar came against Jerusalem, besieged it, and took away uh, the people and the things that he desired at those particular given times. Zedekiah was the last king that reigned after that. Gedaliah was put in place by Nebuchadnezzar as governor over the basically now just a a Babylonian province uh, of Judah and Jerusalem there. And it says in Second Chronicles, again, 15 and following, the reasons. The Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them by his messengers, rising up early and sending them because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. That's why decade after decade after decade, Jeremiah and his contemporaries, Isaiah before him, were sent to the kings and to the leaders and to the people of Israel and then of Judah to warn and to warn and to warn. Why? Because God had compassion on his people and called them decade after decade after decade to repent and to turn away and to avoid that which could be avoided. But they mocked the messengers of God, it says there in verse 16. They despised his words, they scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. Therefore he brought against them the king of the Chaldeans, that's the Babylonians, who killed their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion on young man or virgin, on the aged or the weak. He gave them all into his hand and all the articles from the house of God, great and small, the treasures of the house of the Lord, the treasures of the king and of his leaders, all these he took to Babylon. Then they burned the house of God, burned down, broke down the wall of Jerusalem, burned all its palaces with fire and destroyed all its precious possessions. So there again you have those sieges that take place and the things that happen in Judah and Jerusalem, 605 to 597 to 586, where the destruction of Judah and Jerusalem was total. Now, it wasn't just kings and possessions of Judah that were taken into captivity in Babylon, as I said, at the various different times, but also other people were. You take your defeated king, uh, your foreign defeated king into captivity, that's a good trophy. But other trophies, as I said, like Daniel, like the young and the talented among them, are stripped of that country and become instead the future of the victor's country. 
And so we come back now to Daniel chapter 1, where it gave us a little bit of that history. And we pick up where we left off a little bit ago in verse 3, and it says now with Daniel there and uh, the people there among the, among the Babylonians. It says in verse 3, Then the king Nebuchadnezzar instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. I mentioned this a little bit a few minutes ago. That entire process is really meant to do two main things. The first main thing that that does, obviously, is it depletes your defeated foe, Judah in this case. It depletes Judah of their best and of their brightest, of the young men in particular who would grow up to be leaders, while at the same time discouraging a revolt by them because they don't have the best and the brightest and the strongest and all of that stuff that's been stripped away. And so it very deliberately depletes the enemy, Judah in this case, uh, Babylon, uh, Babylon's enemy. But it also, at the same time, obviously, then adds to Babylon. It takes away from Judah and their future, and it adds now to Babylon and to their prestige and to their might and to their knowledge and to their future. It adds to Babylon's king. It adds to Babylon's court. It adds to Babylon's kingdom any and all of the available young talent. As we saw there in those three verses, there is obviously great investment made into their training and into their indoctrination. The best education is available. The history, as it says, the literature, the language of the Chaldeans, to fully bring them into the Babylonian fold of culture and of society and of understanding their laws and their ways and to be obviously a part of in their mind, their future. And even in particular cases like Daniel and his friends, even up to and including being part of their leadership. So the best education is here. The best food is given to them. And it's a three-year apprenticeship, a three-year indoctrination and education and preparation and training program. Part of incorporating them into Babylonian society and service includes something that might seem small, but it's not, and that's a name change. This is also to signify to you as the individual who's been taken captive, trained, and given a new name. It signifies to you that all hope of your old life is absolutely gone. There is no return. Uh, there is no... Uh, great nostalgic past that you should even consider. Everything for you is now forward. And everything for you forward has to do with this place, Babylon. Our ways, our language, our literature, our history, our future, our culture, our laws, so that you understand all of those things and can be a help to us. But included in that is a name change. A name change is something that we see in the scriptures often, right? That identifies a significant transition in someone's life. Sometimes it's for ill, sometimes it is for good. You have Abram and Sarai changed to Abraham and Sarah by God himself. You have Jacob, obviously, changed to Israel by God himself. Those things signified a, new, a, a transition into a new chapter of serving and usefulness by the Lord. You have even the kings that I mentioned earlier. You have when the one king of Judah came under the king of Egypt. He says, great, and now you get a new name. His name was Eliakim. He changed it to Jehoiakim. He changed it into the name that I want for you. That means something to me and so that you can understand who you are now. You get a new name. That's in a bad way. In a good way, like the others that I already mentioned, you have in the New Testament, you have Saul to Paul. You have this significant change now in this person's life to signify a different person heading in a different direction. So you have those things happen in Scripture. Here, these Hebrew young men who've been incorporated now into Babylon are given their Babylonian names. Verse 6 says, Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, 
and Azariah. To them, the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Those are famous names for us. If you grew up going to Sunday school, you know those names. And it's a significant thing with the name changes and the meanings of them. As far as the Babylonians are concerned, they intend for it to mean new life heading this direction. You belong to us now. But it's significant what these men's names were and what the Babylonians changed their names to. The name Daniel means God is my judge. Changed to Belteshazzar meaning Bel's prince, B-E-L, one of the names of the main gods of the Babylonians. Instead of God meaning Yahweh is my judge, instead now it's you are Bel's prince. You're the prince of our God. The name Hananiah means beloved by the Lord. That's changed to Shadrach. That means uh, loosely based when, when they looked at the name, it's illumined by a sun god, one of the sun gods of the Babylonians. They were a, a multi-god uh, paganistic system there, and so they had gods of different things. And so that's Shadrach is now, he's given a name that ties him to a Babylonian god, not the god of Israel, but Babylon's god. The name Mishael means who is as God. It's changed to Meshach, who is like Venus, or a, or a word that can be translated for Venus there. Again, uh, Venus is, is Greek or Roman, but that's, that points to one of Babylon's gods. You're now tied to our God. You're in service to our ways, and you're in service to our God. Azariah means the Lord is my help, changed to Abednego, servant of Nego or Nebo as well. Nebo or Nebo uh, was another one of the main gods of the Babylonians now. So again, uh, the Lord is my help. No, now you're servant of Nego or Nebo. That's who you are now. And I want to just stop for us right there tonight and consider that and what it means for us in this world. There's a lot about what we're going to look at in our study of Daniel that's going to relate directly to us. As I mentioned at the outset, the character and the diligence and the faithfulness, the endurance and the courage of Daniel, that should relate directly to us. The courage of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the, in the, facing the fiery furnace of Nebuchadnezzar, that should, that should embolden us to see what it is that God did. And, and before God even did it, even if God didn't work a miracle, you have those guys say, we don't care what you do, we're not bowing down to your God. And he can save us from the fire, but if he doesn't, I don't care. That's a paraphrase. We'll get there to that chapter, and you have that kind of courage saying, it does not matter what you do, what you say, you can set up whatever you want, you can start the music, we're not bowing down to your statue. We are going to remain faithful to our God. And that's significant to look at as we close just with those name changes there. Seemingly insignificant, but it's not. You have these kinds of men who went through the three years of training, came out top of the class, as we'll see. Extraordinary, these four young men. Extraordinary, in not just in the eyes of Judah before, and that's why they were taken, but extraordinary in the eyes of Babylon and of, of Nebuchadnezzar in particular. And you have these men who were indoctrinated, who were given even new names that were meant to tie them and to, to disconnect them from their God and tie them now to this pagan system. And you have now, for us, when we consider that, you, they were living in a system, we are living in a world today that desires to do that very thing to disconnect you, to disconnect your kids, to disconnect your grandkids, to disconnect your family, to disconnect the people of this church and other churches who love God, to disconnect, if it were possible, to disconnect us from our God and to tie us and to attach us, if they could, to their system. And that is something that we see they try to do, not just with the name changes, but with the threats to the three young men and to Daniel later and the lion's den and all those kinds of things, they continue to lay stuff out in front of them that challenges their commitment to their God. This world continues to do that very thing. The prophetic scriptures, not just in Daniel, but in many places, every time we have something that uh, takes any kind of detail describing the end of days, it includes persecution of those who love the Lord. 
those who belong to Jesus, those who love the truth. And it is their desire to disconnect, again, if that could be done, to disconnect the believer, to disconnect the Jesus follower, to disconnect us from the fear and the love of God, and to attach us to their way. And my desire, as I, as I look through 12 chapters of Daniel, my desire is that we would take the preparation of the prophecies and the perseverance of the person, Daniel, and that we would take those kinds of things and as we see them now slapped with new names, it's now official. You belong to us. But as we see, none of the four of them bow down. None of the four of them compromise. None of the four of them join in. None of the four of them live out their new names. Instead, they stay true to the name that attaches them to the Lord their God. And that's what a follower of Jesus is. That's what a real Christian does. Christian, sad to say, is a term that anymore doesn't carry much of what it used to carry with it. It used to actually mean follower of Jesus Christ. Anymore, however, you could poll people and find all kinds of definitions of what a Christian is. And oftentimes, most of them having very little to do with knowing the Lord personally, living a life that demonstrates faithfulness and servitude to the Lord God, to Jesus our King, to the fact that someone could even explain that it means I've been born again, that that's actually a requirement, Jesus said to Nicodemus, to, in order to enter the kingdom of God, you have to be born again. It's not something you talk about. It's not something you just claim for yourself. It's something that God actually has to do to you when you turn to him. And that the spirit of God actually regenerates a person. That from spiritually dead, they become spiritually alive. And yet, you have the life of the believer now. You have the courageous, bold testimony of Christians, real Christians. And it is an annoyance to the world. It is a great problem. It is a burr to them. It's one of those sticky things you get stuck in your sock when you walk through the bramble bushes and you go, man, what, how can so many of these get stuck to me? It's actually a lot more annoying than that. That's fairly easy to deal with. We, however, are not so easy to deal with. And I can promise you, according to God's word, that they will continue to come up with ways to attempt if it could be done, to disconnect us from our God. Part of it is actually even just the watering down of the term Christian. That's so annoying that you could say to somebody, you could say to 10 different people that you're a Christian and they're going to walk away with 10 different ideas of who you are and what you're about. That's pretty sad. You know, it's almost like we have to pick another name or something. But I think follower of Jesus Christ will always do. These four men despite what the Babylonians taught them, and despite being slapped with new names, stayed true to the Lord their God. Didn't matter what's put in front of them. I know who I am in the Lord. And you can label me anything that you want, but I am follower of my God. I am as one of these. I'm a servant of the Lord, and the Lord is my help. That's who I am. And so I want to just encourage us as we begin a study like this, that that would be the case, and that that's going to be the kind of thing I hope that you can take away something from every study that we spend our time in in Daniel, that you can t take away that basic truth in some way. You are who you are in Jesus Christ because of the saving grace of God and his sovereign work in the affairs of man. That's an overarching theme of Daniel. Things are dark and bad, and you're not even home. You're in a pagan kingdom, and, and there's lions, and there's fiery furnaces, and there's all this stuff. And then you have the prophecies that talk about the end of days, and it's some dark, dreadful stuff. And it shows that God is sovereign over the affairs of men. God's people are his people, and they will never not be his people. You are attached, if you're a Christian, if you're a true believer in Jesus Christ, by the grace of God, through faith in him alone, you're his and you can't be theirs. Jesus promised that no one, nothing can take them out of my hand. And Paul wrote that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. And he listed some pretty 
challenging stuff, both physical and spiritual, and nothing can separate us from the love of God. This study is going to enforce that for us, is my hope. It does for me already. I'm thrilled with this study. I'm thrilled with just taking the time to read through Daniel. So let's take away what God has for us. Our God is faithful, and we who are his are secure. Let's pray. God, our Father, we thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness, that despite the best efforts of Babylon, these four men, we will see, are faithful to the end. According to your promise, those who are endured to the end are saved. We thank you for that good promise, Lord. We thank you for the security and the assurance we have of our salvation. We know that culture can change and is. Laws can change and do. Opinions can change and they are. Education systems can change. Governments can change, uh, can even change hands. But the people of God, we, Lord, who belong to you, we serve a mighty, unchanging, holy, faithful, sovereign God. And we delight to carry your name. Followers of Jesus Christ. People who, because of your grace and mercy, we are also among the people of God. Glorious and awesome are you. And blessed and encouraged are we. We love you, Lord. And pray that you would fashion and form in us the diligence and the perseverance of these men, Daniel in particular, as we look at his life. We thank you for him, Lord. We thank you for what you say about yourself in this book. And we gladly take it in because we need it in these days especially. Strengthen us like these. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.